Hello friends and welcome back to day something of the DC. <laughs> Great start Hazel. I've no idea what day it is anymore as I'm sure neither do you. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit more from chapter one of my book today. All the links to pre-order are in the description as always. Uh, so get yourself comfy, get cosy, get a cuppa, whatever you need to do um, to get settled and relaxed. And we're just going to, we're just going to dive right back in where we left off. Then came Theo's birthday. A few weeks had passed since our dinner and we hadn't spoken once, so I decided to extend an olive branch and send him a text to wish him happy birthday. He didn't reply. A few days later, I texted again to ask if he was okay. No reply. When another week passed with no word from him, I sent him an email saying I wanted to know where we stood. I knew it was over and I wasn't hoping to get back together, but at dinner he seemed keen to stay friends and now I got the impression he didn't want to hear from me. It was confusing as all hell and I just wanted some clarity. Two days later I received an email so bizarre that it's difficult to describe without quoting the whole thing directly. Suffice to say it sounded like a canned response, the likes of which you would expect to receive in reply to a complaint about a faulty refrigerator, not a heartfelt message to your former life partner. There is an unmistakably almost human tone to such emails, a sort of faux empathetic sentiment with a decidedly corporate undertone, the uncanny valley of language. It began with a formal greeting, included something about him appreciating my patience in these difficult circumstances, and ended with the line, I do hope this correspondence has not caused you any further concern. Another mini revelation, another gap in the clouds. This time I realised two things. One, he lied about wanting to be friends and was continuing to lie because he was too cowardly to just tell me he never wanted to see me again. And two, he did not write that email. Among the belongings Theo left behind was his old mobile phone. He had only recently upgraded and left the old one in his desk drawer, now my desk drawer. And for weeks I had resisted the urge to turn it on and find out what he'd been saying about me to his friends. That would, of course, be a massive breach of privacy and no good would come of it. But at 4am on this particular night, his right to privacy seemed suddenly unimportant. I had to know who wrote that email. So I charged his phone, switched it on and typed in his PIN number. There had been no secrets between us after all. I found a conversation between him and two of his female co-workers, Leslie and Victoria, in which he had sent them my email and asked them to draft a reply. I should mention at this point that I used to work at the same company as Theo, him in the accounting department and me writing press releases. So I had met these two women quite a few times at conferences and Christmas parties and such. We weren't exactly close friends, but I knew them well enough to be absolutely mortified by this. Not to mention I'd been aware for some time of a flirtation between Theo and Leslie. There was a lot to take in, but one part that stood out was Victoria suggesting that Theo avoid the phrase, I've moved on. It sounds too much like you're seeing another person, she said. Oh really, Vicky, he asked. Then how do I make it clear I'm seeing multiple people? Then he wrote the word LOL in all caps several times. I'm moving in several different directions, she suggested. An excessive number of LOLs followed. After this, they spoke at length about what a crazy bitch I am. He said that I'd been messaging him, acting weird, and that he was terrified I would show up at his office unannounced. For the record, I had no intention of doing anything of the sort, but I took some joy in the fact that he was afraid I might. Theo said he needed to send this ASAP to get me off his back. Then they joked about my email to him and I crumbled. Suddenly the faces of every one of his exes flashed through my mind. Women I'd met at parties or weddings or school reunions, each one of them a crazy bitch according to him. He never spoke to any of them. He had cut them out immediately following their breakups. He confided this to me, joked with me about it, just as he was joking now with these other women about me. I got angry then, not at him, but at myself. I had known he was capable of doing this. I was just too naive and too arrogant to believe he would do it to me. We all think we'll be different, don't we? I opened his messages and the first conversation I found was with Darren. I scrolled back to the date of the breakup and found the usual supportive messages you'd expect to find from a friend. Darren saying it was the right thing to do, assuring him we'd both be okay, suggesting they go out for a pint to talk it over. Theo never seemed to take him up on this offer though, and instead struck up a conversation with an old uni mate named Isaac. Just four days into what Theo was then calling our break, he started telling Isaac about the women he'd been pursuing. He said he'd gone back to that club last night and got another girl's number. He talked about a woman he'd met online who he was going on a date with. He took her out for breakfast on his birthday, as it transpires. And he seemed particularly keen on a girl named Natalie, who he'd been introduced to at a friend's party. 
Isaac and I never really got along. His sole purpose in life was to get laid, so I was surprised to see him being jovial but firm with Theo. He suggested that Theo slow down a bit and process what he was going through. He also pointed out that Natalie had just gone through a breakup too and might need to be alone for a while, something Theo should maybe consider himself. It had been a long time since I'd seen Isaac and apparently he'd gone and done some growing up, but Theo was having none of it. He said that Natalie being unavailable only made her more appealing. And then he went on to describe in great detail the kind of things he'd like to do to her. Through a deluge of tears and with shaking hands, I continued. I wasn't proud of myself, nor did I feel one iota of guilt. Perhaps I should have. These were his private messages after all, but I didn't have the capacity to care. What followed was a blurry montage of conversations with other male friends, some luder than others, as well as messages to the women themselves. Each time Theo opened with a similar comment about how he'd enjoyed meeting the girl in question, then followed up with a funny quip specific to their interaction, the tailored touch, nice, and ended with an invitation to grab a coffee or go for a drink or a run, depending on her interests. It was all so measured, so strategic, that it gave me chills. One conversation got pretty filthy pretty fast, including pictures from both parties, and I couldn't close it fast enough. By 5am I was having a full-blown meltdown. I called Maya. She answered the phone and was met with the sound of my raspy breaths. All right, she said. Are you choking? I managed to croak a no at her. Have you hurt yourself? No. Do you need me to call an ambulance? No. Do you need me to call the police? No. Are you just having a mental breakdown relating to your recent breakup? Yes, that one. Well, I'm here and I'll stay on the line and you can just talk when you're ready. God bless this woman. Once I'd regained something akin to normal breathing, I told her what I'd found. She listened quietly for a long time and then finally she spoke. Right, well, he's a cunt. I agreed. I know you're upset and you have every right to be because what you've just seen is both disgusting and heartbreaking, but I think we can all agree that you are better off without that sociopathic twat in your life. Also, for what it's worth, he's not okay. This is him acting out because he's incapable of processing his emotions. You'll deal with this. You'll bounce back. He won't. How does she always know exactly what to say? Also, he has stupid hair. It's very generic. That's fair, I said. And he was a bit racist. Whoa, he's not racist. Well, he was always weird with me, she said. Yeah, but not because you're black for fuck's sake. He's weird with all my friends. This is part of the problem, Maya. He's socially inept. Fine, she said, but his grandmother was a racist old hag, Lord rest her soul. She was, I agreed. And his mother's not much better. Don't get me started on his fucking mother, Maya. We laughed at this, but the laughter didn't feel right. There was a hollow sort of ache in my chest. I failed, I said finally. At what? The relationship. Don't be ridiculous, said Maya. You can't fail at a relationship. That's like getting off a roller coaster and saying you failed because the ride is over. Things end, babe. That doesn't mean the experience wasn't worth it. I'm not sure it was worth it, Maya. What did I get out of it? You got what you needed, she said. And then one day it wasn't what you needed anymore. I'm not sure when that day was. I think it was a while ago, my love, said Maya, sadly. Were we ever happy? I'm not being facetious. I genuinely can't remember. You were happy, Maya assured me. You were fucking delirious. I saw it with my own two eyes and... Things being shit now doesn't erase all the good stuff. It still happened, but pain is an inevitable part of life. It just feels like I'm getting more than my fair share of it sometimes, that's all. You've not exactly been lucky, no, said Maya, but everyone has their shit. And I know there'll be more shit for me down the line. Even if Darren and I don't get divorced, one of us will get sick and die and I'll feel my pain then. It's just a matter of when. This isn't your best pep talk ever, Maya laughed. My point is, the only way not to feel pain is to never love anyone. That's beginning to feel like a real option, I said. By 6am, Maya needed to get up and make breakfast for her baby, and I apologised profusely for making her day that bit harder. She of course told me it was fine, but as soon as I hung up, I ordered her a bunch of flowers anyway. Then I went to the shop to buy some boxes because I had decided during our phone call that today was the day I would pack Theo's things. I had a video call with my mum that day, which lasted roughly eight hours. She went about her business in the background, tidying the house and making phone calls and cooking dinner, while I separated our record and DVD collections, stuffed his clothes into bags, packed boxes full of books and stacked all of our framed pictures up against one wall. 
I sifted through our memory box, the general detritus of a four-year relationship, which I had collected from the start. There were hundreds of photographs and postcards and ticket stubs, but the birthday cards were the worst part. His handwriting, his promises of loyalty and love and happily ever afters. My mother told me to rip them up, but I couldn't. I felt sorry for myself then. It wasn't fair. Why should I have to do this alone? How come he got to just move out and move on? He would never have to look at this stuff again or sit like I am now, sorting through it all. I was sinking fast when my wonderfully dark mind offered me a solution. I took a drawer full of important documents and files, his bank statements, tax records, letters pertaining to stocks and shares, even his birth certificate, and I emptied it into a massive cardboard box. On top of all these things he would absolutely need to find at some point, I poured the contents of our memory box and a bunch of funny looking stuffed animals we'd collected from zoos around the world. I added his collection of 1977 mint condition stormtrooper figurines for good measure. Then I picked it up, shook it really hard for about 30 seconds, put it down and sealed it. I called it the Box of Doom. Maya suggested I cover all his clothes in glitter too, but I felt that was a step too far. By that evening, one half of my bedroom was stacked full of boxes and I had officially moved from sadness into anger, a far more productive phase of the grieving process. I didn't reply to the email Theo didn't write, nor did I contact him about the messages I shouldn't have seen. I spent the following week working, seeing friends and redecorating the apartment. Then, when I was ready, I called him to say I had boxed up his stuff and would appreciate if he could come collect it as soon as possible. He seemed thrown by my matter-of-fact tone. I enjoyed that, but much more than that, I enjoyed his suggestion that he drop by in a cab to pick it all up. He seemed genuinely taken aback when I explained that he had actually been living with me for quite some time, and during that time he had amassed a lot of belongings. When I told him to hire a removal van, he let out a long, unnecessarily loud sigh to indicate just how much of an inconvenience this was. I pictured him there, phone in one hand, rubbing his forehead with the other, eyes scrunched up. And in that moment, I was glad to be rid of him and his stupid, stressed out face. He's standing in the hallway now, looking into the bedroom, processing the new decor and the number of boxes I've stacked from floor to ceiling. There's so many. I did say, I call back from the kitchen. As I reach into the cupboard for some mugs, he speaks again, quieter this time. Thanks for packing it all for me. He glances towards me, all doe eyes and guilt, and for a moment he is my Theo again. You're welcome, I say. Theo goes into the bedroom and as I pour water over a tea bag, I'm distracted. I look back at the spot where he stood and remember the night he left, just over a month ago. I stopped him, grabbed him, and we stood holding one another for what felt like far too long and not nearly long enough. I tried, right there on that very spot, to commit the feel of him to my memory. The weight of his arms, the exact pressure they exerted on my body, the concave dip of his chest where my head rested neatly, how my right hip bone pressed against his left, and how my shoulders folded bird-like as he pulled me into him. When he took a step back, I remained motionless. He kissed me, said he loved me, and with that he was gone. There was a silence then, more than a silence, a vacuum. I felt like all the air had been sucked out of the room and I now stood inside a void so dense that my skull might implode from the pressure. The door seemed to bend impossibly towards me, then away, and I reeled, turning towards the kitchen and stepping onto nothing as though my legs had disappeared. Before I could check if they were still there, a convulsion seized me and I grabbed onto a door frame leaned over and retched. Nothing came up. I hadn't eaten that day. I lowered myself to the floor and lay face down with my cheek against the wood and somewhere in the distance I could hear a whistling sound. I don't know how long I stayed that way. Hours, maybe, or it might have just seemed like hours. But at some point I flashed on the pregnancy test I'd taken that morning, a blue cross forming in a tiny window. I saw it materialise over and over, then pushed it away. I can't think about that today, I thought. I'll think about that tomorrow. Those weren't my words, though. They were Scarlett O'Hara's. And suddenly her voice was in my head and I was 12 years old again, lying in my mother's bed watching Gone with the Wind. My mother. I should call my mother. I'd been recovering from a particularly horrendous bout of food poisoning. I'd had a fever for two days. And when she thought I was better, she gave me apple juice and I vomited it back up hot and thick. I haven't drunk apple juice since. I should eat something. I need to eat. I need to call my mother. What will I tell her? What the hell is that whistling sound? It was me. I was sucking air through what felt like a tiny hole in my throat and my long laboured breaths were producing a sound not unlike nails on a chalkboard. 
I probably would have passed out had my stomach not growled so loudly that the sound actually startled me. I told myself out loud to get off the floor. Then I scrambled my way back up the door frame and eventually wobbled my way to the kitchen like a fawn on brand new legs. I ate a piece of dry toast and went to bed where I lay howling till I fell asleep. I had never cried like that before. The sounds were guttural and animalistic and I let them come. The next morning I went into the office to write. I didn't need to be there, I just wanted to be around people. And several times that day I excused myself, vomited in the toilet, then got back to work. The day after that, I got my hair cut, went to the bank and had a meeting with my publicist in a cat themed cafe. I was in shock and I knew it. But I decided that as long as I was still functioning, I should get as much done as possible. I felt like I'd been stabbed and at any moment the knife might be pulled out, sending blood gushing everywhere and forcing me to deal with my injuries. Until then though, I would continue about my business, knife and all. The third day was the charm. I actually felt myself go. People talk about hearts breaking all the time, but I don't know how many of them have felt their brain break. It's an interesting sensation. I packed a bag and got a taxi to the airport where I marched up to the check-in desk in a headscarf and sunglasses and asked for a one-way ticket on the next flight to Ireland. I had become a scarf-clad cliche. By the time I landed in Dublin, I was a jittery mess. I knew I couldn't keep going for much longer. So the hour long wait at passport control because only two desks were open that day was a real fucking treat. When I got through the arrival gates and saw my mother waiting there for me, it took every shred of strength I had left not to collapse into her arms and allow myself to fall apart. As she approached me, I held one hand out in front of me and looked at her with a face that I hoped said, I love you dearly, but please do not show me affection right now. She took my suitcase and walked me to her car in complete silence. I stayed in Dublin for a week where I spent every day on the sofa with her next to me in an armchair. We talked endlessly about my failed relationship and what would happen next. I refused to simply wait and let things unfold and I insisted on speculating incessantly about every single aspect of it. Why he left, whether he'd come back, if he was seeing someone else, if maybe we could be friends. She nodded at me and cried with me and most importantly, she prevented me from calling him. I couldn't eat. I was hungry, but the physical act of swallowing food made me gag. My mother fed me food in tiny portions, segments of sausage on my niece's pink plastic plate, sandwiches cut into four triangles. The deal was she'd eat two if I ate two. I was a child again. She even put sugar in my tea, something I gave up years ago. Anything to get calories into me. Phone calls were made, family members were notified, condolences were offered. A breakup is like a death without a funeral. At night, I took sleeping pills, which had been prescribed to my mother after surgery last winter to remove one of her kidneys. I remember the night she called me. I was standing in the frozen food aisle of a Tesco Metro with a packet of peas in one hand and my phone in the other. She rambled on at length about hospitals and positive thinking and whether or not she'd be fit to cook Christmas dinner. And all I had actually heard were the words tumour and malignant. Are we talking about the C word here? I asked. What? She bellowed. She thought I meant cunt. She hates that word. The other C word, I said. Oh, she replied, much more quietly. Yes, love, we are. After we hung up, I stood a while longer till I could no longer feel my hand. Then I put back the bag of peas, abandoned the basket of food by my feet and had wine for dinner instead. The surgery was a success, but it took more of a toll on my mother than any of us expected. She retired soon after, leaving her younger sister in charge of the interior design business she'd set up shortly after my father left. She hadn't planned on retiring so young. She was only 58 at the time, and after a string of failed relationships, she used to joke that she was married to her company, but the wind had been well and truly knocked out of her sails. My sister and brother had been there for her through the operation, but they had their own families to take care of and jobs to get back to. And since I can do my job from anywhere, I decided to go home for a few weeks to help nurse my mother better. In an odd way, I was thankful I'd had the chance to do that, to preemptively make up for the care she was giving me now. That's it for today. Only one instalment left. Very exciting. That will be the instalment that I filmed when I was in Thailand, by the way. So you have that to look forward to. Bit of a different video. Uh, hope you've been enjoying it so far. Hope you enjoy the last instalment of it. And I hope you're keeping well and safe and staying inside. Unless you're supposed to go out for your job or something. In which case, hope that's okay also. Um, take care and I will see you tomorrow. Slum.